Welcome to another Ramdas Here and Now podcast. I'm Jackie Dobrinska, your host, and you are the Ramdas community. And we are thrilled you have tuned in, joining many brilliant souls from around the globe who find inspiration in the wisdom of Ramdas. Today we dive into episode 257 Perspectives on Death. So this is a really insightful talk from 1986 where Ramdas is addressing hospital staff where they are looking at the impact of death on both patients and caregivers. And he challenges this conventional view on death at the time that's still alive to this day, um, that somehow death is a failure. And he offers some alternative perspectives that are rooted in Eastern philosophies, And he also provides some valuable reflections specifically on maintaining a compassionate connection with those as they move through this particular transition of their lives and deaths, um, as well as on being a caretaker and managing burnout. Um, So he's really encouraging a more transformative approach to understanding death and dying and inviting us all to look at the ways we show up and look at how we fall into roles and instead um, really be there for the experience of death to face ours and others' mortality. And while he is speaking to the medical profession, clearly this is a message for all of us in our culture. Um, And whenever I am in the realm of death and dying, one of the things that comes up is something a friend of mine used to say that I love, which is, none of us get out of here alive. And sort of echoes this Eastern sentiment that says, to keep death on your left shoulder. This idea that when we keep death near, uh, we actually deepen our appreciation for life and we foster a more profound sense of gratitude for what is and actually become more mindful in each moment because we know that it's ephemeral. Um, And not only each moment, but also our relationships and our experiences that we can welcome even the challenging ones more easily. Uh, And this is something I know I want and I would imagine many of you want as well. And um, I have, like maybe like many of you, have lots of ample reminders. I volunteer at this place called the Center for Conscious Living and Dying. There's this incredible book I've started going through called A Year to Live. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be able to have conversations with friends of Ramdas, like Ramdev, who was the co-founder of the Living Dying Project with Ramdas. And, you know, even with all of these reminders of death will come for all of us, um, I still fall into my habits and forget and live from this, you know, egocentric self-preservation place um, that, that can numb me out a little bit. It's, it's the habits and the ignorance. Um, so I love that we get to have these talks to remind us because we need it over and over again, I think. Um, and then when we leave them, maybe we leave with a little bit more of that ability to live fully and humbly and graciously and in harmony with our true self and the rhythms of the world. Um, But, you know, it's interesting to sort of think about death from these different planes of consciousness. And there's a few things that always come up for me when when we talk about death. And one is our relationship to human death versus the death of other life forms, whether uh, whether trees or uh, animals or rivers, and how do we respect all of it the life of all things, but also without fearing death, without pushing death away. So also recognizing that all of these things will pass. We will pass. Um, The the plants will become soil or, you know, the the life force for other animals. Um, What will happen for us, you know? How do we move forward? How do we contribute to these rhythms and cycles. And then what about that part of us that isn't the body? Um, I think all of this is part of our awakening and it's so fascinating to get together and ponder and discuss. And so that's what we ask, that whatever comes up for you in these conversations, you bring your voice to our um, 
twice a month gatherings, our soul pod gatherings. So it's a place where you can find like-minded friends that you just haven't met yet. If you're interested, go to ramdas.org slash fellowship and learn more. And then remember, you can support Be Here Now Network in producing these podcasts, either by donating or by joining Patreon. And with Patreon, you can dive into every episode of Here and Now without ads. And you can choose, if you'd like, to skip the introductions and just go straight to the lecture, or you can continue to listen to the introductions. If you join Patreon, we will also bring you a guided practice from Ramdas and or friends each week. So check that out. And lastly, always want to say thank you to Magic Mind, which is this lovely little elixir that helps me and many people I know now uh, have more energy and be more productive. Uh, it's become one of my best friends for a while now. Uh, I just am a little happier throughout the day when I drink it. And that's partially because it has all these incredible adaptogens that help improve mood and help you relax. So check it out at magicmind.com slash Ramdas and use the code Ramdas for a discount off your subscription. And with that, I just want to say, as always, a great big thank you to Ramdas, who brings us all together here for the wisdom that he has brought to the world. And also a thank you to the network and the team that brings us these podcasts and our sponsors that bring us these podcasts. And then, of course, all of you for tuning in because that's why we do it. And also, we just want to take a moment and pause and give thanks that we have the privilege to be able to listen to these teachings and that we dedicate even this as a practice to benefit all beings everywhere. And so with that, here is Ram Dass, here and now. My topic is perspectives on death, which is an interesting topic to present in a hospital because as we all understand the hospital is committed to the preservation of life. It's interesting that the roles one finds oneself in in a hospital require that you fulfill that commitment to the preservation of life. What that role entails with regard to your attitude towards death however is another matter and very often we sometimes mass together the idea that preservation of life must see death therefore as a failure or as the enemy or as loss and that is a, a very common predicament in the medical community it's interesting that you live out here in this beautiful country where you watch the seasons change and you don't feel it's a failure of the tree when it drops its leaves and you don't feel it's a failure of the tree when it grows old and it falls over and it turns back into the earth and nurtures future trees you have a sense of the continuity of nature but there is some way in which the role of the medical community starts to find itself pitted against a certain kind of rhythm of life and death a certain kind of uh, appropriateness or harmony in the way of things and it's raising especially now with technology developing as it is a number of ethical and moral issues but also issues I think that are internal problems for the medical community in terms of frustration in terms of really burnout I think and uh, I'd like to reflect about that issue a little bit with you today I uh, arrived at this interest in this issue in a somewhat backdoor way, not as a psychologist particularly, but as a spiritual seeker who had gone to India. And um, in the course of my studies over there, I began to see that people in different cultures, different religious traditions, had a different philosophical underpinning about the meaning of a life and thus the meaning of a death and they were able to see life and death as part of 
a process in which death had its own harmony. And I even realized that in the East, in um, uh, the more intense religious traditions, such as uh, among the Buddhist monks, for example, they saw life as a preparation for the moment of death. Now, we don't see that at all here. We see that death, because we are living in what is primarily, uh, even though most of us have had some religious training and we give at least lip service and some heart service to Christianity or to whatever religious tradition we have, we still are primarily philosophical materialists that when you are dead, you're dead. And we say, well, it's a mystery beyond that. But we are not very deeply rooted in the sense of the continuity of spirit, of the continuity of soul. And when you come to a tradition in which the dominant theme is the continuity of awareness before birth and after death, the meaning of a life and death is quite different. And the way in which one approaches death is very different. And um, the experience that I had that I was very dramatic for me was when I first went to India, uh, I had the Western model pretty much, even though I'd had these experiences of a sense of uh, awareness independent of body. I went to uh, Banaras, which is known as the city of dying in India. It's the most, one of the most sacred cities in India. And uh, there on the streets are many uh, lepers, people with advanced cancer, people with uh, uh, huge goiters, with all kinds of problems, and um, often with just a loincloth, uh, enough money on their loincloth for their, the wood for their funeral pyre, and a begging bowl. And I was walking through the streets with my uh, American Express traveler's checks, and um, with a sense of uh, pity, with a sense of the horrendous nature which you feel often when you're in India about the economics, about the starvation, about all of that. And as a Westerner would say, gee, this place is in terrible shape. We ought to do something about it. Somebody ought to do something about it. I was so pained by it that I went back to my hotel. I didn't even want to stay on the streets. It was just too painful to think about these people. Shortly thereafter, I met my spiritual teacher, and I ended up spending the winter in a, a temple in India. And I became steeped in the philosophy and the religious stance of the people. And when I came back about five, six months later to Benares again, I walked down the street with an entirely different perceptual stance regarding what was going on. Because I realized that these people had come from all over India in order to die in Benares, to, be, to die in Benares and get burned by the Ganges River in Benares is the most auspicious thing a Hindu person can do. It assures that they are liberated at that moment. This is, it's such a deep belief system that when I and had quieted down through this training, I looked into their eyes, which I had averted my gaze before, I looked into their eyes and I saw them looking back at me in a completely calm and present way. And in fact, some of them were looking at me with pity. And I, at first, that shook me until I realized they saw me as somebody who was confused, wandering around the world, somewhat lost in what my life was about, while they knew exactly what their life was about. And they were at home, and they were perfectly centered and structured in their life. And I began to see that the philosophical stance a person had affected very dramatically how they met their death and how they approached their death. And I further saw, as I studied Buddhism, I noticed that, for example, the Theravadan Buddhists, the monks are given meditations in which, in the old days, the bodies of Buddhists were thrown into the cemetery and they were eaten by the birds. And the monks were usually sent to the cemetery for nights, all night, to sit and meditate on the decaying body, on the fly-infested corpse, on the bloated body, on the skeleton. And they did these meditations in order to, in a way, loosen their attachment to the body and to see the ephemeral or changing nature of the body. And the purpose was 
to let go of the attachment to the concept of life as the body so that they would keep their consciousness right in the moment. And so the dying process, instead of being filled with I'm dying or don't let me die, they would merely be attentive to the moment of as each process unfolded in the moment. For example, in Tibetan Buddhism, the monk is trained to notice exactly the processes that are going on at the moment of dying. Not to be drugged into unconsciousness, but to stay very, very clear. And for example, they notice in their uh, system, they notice as the earth element changes, they feel the heaviness and they note heaviness. As the water element leaves, they note dryness and they note it as dryness. They keep their consciousness focused on just what's happening at the moment. As, when, as they say, as the fire element leaves, they notice and they notice coldness. And as the air element leaves, they notice the out-breath as longer than the in-breath. In other words, they watch the processes of death. And instead of coming back into their minds of I'm dying, which is a thought away from where the action is, they stay right with the process itself as it's going. And you find that a lot of the anxiety and a lot of the struggle has to do with the concept that the person has about what's happening. Not what's happening. Not the dying process itself. I mean, many of us, I've worked with many, many people, as I'm sure most of you have, as the moment that they, they die. Some of them are struggling terribly hard because they have a model in themselves that this is loss and failure and uh, that, that's terribly frightening. And yet I'm sure many of you have been present with people who die where there is a release, an opening, a letting go, a feeling of rightness, of just tuning, of support, which often leaves the doctor and the nurse feeling privileged to be present or feeling grace to be part of this somewhat mysterious process in which this transformation occurred with there is living spirit and suddenly the body is dead and there's no spirit there and something has gone and, and it stays right at the edge of the unknown. I saw that in the East there was such a lightness about death. I mean, there are Zen poems like uh, a Zen master is dying and he's supposed to write a poem before he dies. That's what Zen masters do. And his students came up and they said, you haven't written your poem. And he says, oh my goodness, hand me my quill. And he calligraphies. And it says, birth is thus, death is thus, verse or no verse, what's the fuss? <laughs> Which I always thought should be followed by Burma shave, but it sounded like a... <laughs> Another monk who they... Uh, brought him his favorite cake as he was dying, and then they leaned over to hear his final mystical words, and his final mystical words is, my, this cake is good. <laughs> and Ramana Maharshi, the Indian saint, who was dying, and his, uh, his devotees were crying and said, don't leave us, don't leave us. And he looked confused. He said, don't be silly. Where could I go? I'm just dropping my body. Now, the term dropping the body is an Indian concept. It says that who I am is not what's dying. I am just dropping, I'm selling my Ford, in effect. No, don't sell your Ford, don't sell your Ford, you see. <laughs> now, uh, in a way, it shifts the nature of the experience of dying, because at that point, the minute you identify with some component in yourself which is not that which dies, you then approach death as a transformational experience rather than an ending experience. It's no different than puberty. I mean, you can imagine collecting baseball cards and then coming into puberty and you say, I'm never going to give up these baseball cards. And then a moment later, they're quite irrelevant just because of something happened in your endocrine system and your whole psyche changed. Well, roughly, this is the way death is seen, is just seen as a transition. You understand it's based on the recognition, which has to come ultimately through some direct experience, the recognition that you are more than your physical body.
that that doesn't cover all of it. And a lot of that thought process has been relegated to the church and relegated to a Sunday morning or an interesting thought. But when you come into the medical community, you continually identify the body with the person. Now, we made one leap when we went from treating the, the ultimate in dying seeing that as the ICU as the best place to die, which in which the body was treated as the major focus and the psychology was treated as somewhat irrelevant. We won't have any dogs and cats and children in here because it will upset the medical support system. Then we moved to start, hospice started to become a, a thought in the world coming from Cecily Saunders and St. Christopher's in England, and it came over, and it slowly come through work of people like Elizabeth Ross. The whole idea that there was a psychological individual that was dying, and could we create a support system to make that a little less painful for the psychological person? by giving them a support system, helping them often to die at home among loved ones, giving them some feeling of control, of psychological control, or even in intensive care units, bringing in more warmth and more human, in other words, honoring the psychology as well as preserving the body. Now that's a shift in, in, a, in focus and in emphasis in the medical community. And that's happened reasonably painlessly in a very few years, in, by the way, in this culture. But the work I'm interested in goes one step further than that because it's really focused on the, if you will, the spiritual awareness of an individual. Because I saw that the people in the East, at least the most evolved ones, saw their death as a transformation and they saw it as a vehicle through which they could awaken more out of that identification. They could break the identification through the process of watching their own death and staying in an environment where other people were not, if you will, sucking them in or catching them in the identification with their body. So I decided to set up a Benares of the West, so to speak, and I set up a thing which I without euphemism, just called the Dying Center. And the Dying Center was a place where people could come who wished to use their dying process as a vehicle for deepening their spiritual understanding of their own identity. That is, loosening the hold of identification with their body through the process of dying. Now, who's going to staff that? Because what you're trying to do is put that person, that patient, in an environment in which the people around that person are not going to keep catching them in their, the drama of dying. Because the drama of dying is the biggest drama going in town. I mean, it sucks everybody in. There's hardly anybody that doesn't get caught in that one. You may stay very, very calm until it comes to the moment of dying, and then everybody's around. I was with a... Um, I was teaching with Elizabeth Ross, and uh, there was a 28-year-old nurse there. She had had something in the order of, it was up to, since she had been six years old, she'd been having operations for cancer. She, uh, there were dozens of operations. She had three or four children. She was now 29 or 30. She's been a very active woman. She was a nurse and she was often in the hospital as a patient. And she said to me, she said to us as the group, what would you feel like if you came to visit me? And then Elizabeth wrote on the board all the answers and people said things like, I would feel angry at the universe for having put you through this. I would feel pity. I would feel, and they, a whole set of emotional reactions to the fact that this woman was in this condition. And she says, do you see my predicament? She said, nobody was with me. Everybody was with my symbolic identity. Everybody saw a 28-year-old nurse with three or four children who was dying of cancer. And I was completely in here screaming, is anybody out there? Does anybody hear me? Because nobody was with me as a fellow human being because my symbolic value was so powerful. Do, do you hear that issue at all? 
that, I mean, when somebody is very, very famous or very, very powerful or very rich or very beautiful in the culture, they are really at an interesting disadvantage. It's very hard for them to make real connections with people because people are so awed by this symbolic value. And people keep responding to the symbol and don't let them in as fellow human beings. And people starve often, emotionally starve. So we decide in the dying center to people it with people like me because I am somebody who wants to spiritually awaken and I realize that the thing that keeps people most asleep in spiritual life is their identity with their separateness and their fear of death, therefore. And therefore, if I really want to awaken, I want to push myself as hard as I can, and the thing that's going to push my buttons the most as a human being is to be in the presence of dying. So that I would like to be around dying people as work on myself. The dying people come to use their dying as work on themselves. In other words, we are creating a monastery or an ashram in which all the people are there in order to awaken and the vehicle that they're working with is the dying process. In other words, instead of the focus being on stopping the dying or anything, the focus is on awakening. Now, what happened, of course, was that people came to the dying center and it was such a nice place to be, they didn't die. <laughs> And, I mean, you can't make people promise to die, and you've only got so many beds, and so we had to change the title to the Living Dying Center because um, <laughs> we were faced with this problem. Um, now, in the traditions that I'm talking about, there are some very clear prescriptions about the issue of why one burns out and how not to burn out. Let's say you are a doctor or a nurse who's getting called at this moment. You're a doctor or a nurse and you experience a, a warm feeling towards your patient and a caring and your technology is limited into what you can do because you're pitting your technology often against a deeper kind of law and a deeper kind of rhythm in the universe and you start to experience failure. Now, what happens the first time it hurts and you go back and you may take a drink or you may talk to your family and you may, it may hurt you and it really pains and you wonder, can I stay in this profession because it's going to hurt so bad? And then there are a number of things that happen after that. But professionals often become what's called professionally warm, which is a very interesting place they get into where their emotions start to be in the service of their intellect. They are caring people, but they protect their hearts because it hurts too bad to have people dying that you're taking care of or people not succeeding in, in beating their illness. And that pain, that attachment to how it comes out makes you ultimately have to deal with the pain by closing down a little bit. You can't handle it because it is going to happen that you are losing patience. I mean, people do die. It just turns out we're all going to die. And uh, most of us are going to die with some medical attention. And therefore, the medical community is going to lose us somewhere along the way. And how do you deal with a situation where you keep losing your patience? Is loss a failure? That's the interesting question. And do you have to make believe it is, or do you think it is? Now, the interesting, delicate line is, can you function in a role of being a healer, being where people seek you out to preserve life, and you can fulfill your function of doing it as effectively as you can without you emotionally being attached to whether or not that person lives or dies? See, that's the interesting one. It's your personal identity. It's your ego involvement in whether you succeed or failure, success being measured as keeping the person alive, that ends up doing you in. It ends up forcing your heart to go into these very strange kind of slightly remote things where you can watch pain and suffering and keep yourself from hurting too bad. The problem with closing down that way is it's not so easy to open up again. 
and a lot of people that are in helping professions feel themselves cut off from life energy a lot in order to be professional. And, to, and they can't go home at the end of the day and necessarily open their hearts again. And there's some kind of professional isolation that comes with the responsibility of having other people's lives in your hands. And the interesting question is whether that's necessary or not. And I'm not sure it is. I really am not. There are two injunctions that the Bhagavad Gita, which is perhaps the most powerful of the Indian books, offers. One of them is, be not identified with being the actor. And the other is, be not attached to the fruits of the action. Now that's pretty strange. How could you take care of a patient without thinking you were taking care of the patient and without being attached to whether the patient gets better? That's what it's saying. Is that a conceivable thing or is that book just off the wall? Was that just an irresponsible statement in a, in a book? I mean, does it possibly have a seed of something in it? It says that if you quiet down your being enough and listen to all the forces in the universe, you will hear that you are trained, you have certain skills, the skills are required in the society, and it is your function to fulfill them in the same way as when you sit in a car you drive, and you fulfill your function. In India, it's called doing your dharma. You do the appropriate actions to your life, but where you keep your mind in relation to it is you don't let your mind get lost into identification with your role. See, for example, somebody has the role of a mother in life. How do you do? My name is Richard. How do you do? I'm a mother. Okay, That's their identity. I'm a mother. What happens when their children grow up? How many of you have watched that kind of anxiety that comes with somebody, look, I'm a mother, but Ma, I'm 50 years old, I'm still your mother. You know, it's, it's, it's an inability to let go of the role. And how many of us are getting our psychological needs from identifying with the role of being a doer who helps, who heals, a certain kind of righteousness that we try to get energy from but the fact of trying to get energy from that leads you to have to deal with the failure experience and with the frustration experience, and ultimately it burns you out. It gets you so that you pull back. Burnout doesn't mean you go running off screaming down the street. It can mean that you just close down a little bit and you fulfill your function, but you're not being fed by it. You're not feeling this incredible sense of, of growth that can come through a life lived as an alive ex a function. In, I experience that when I work with dying people, or people that have terminal, potentially terminal illnesses, that if I'm open to them, the way I walk into a room and meet them is I don't meet them as healer and somebody needing healing, or as dying person and death aid or whatever my role is or as doctor or patient, I walk in and I see another being just like me and that being is going through their life story and I'm going through mine and our life stories are meeting in conjunction at that moment and what we do with each other is what our skills and our needs and so on allow us to do together. The vehicle for us being together happens to be, in one case, in your case, it may, like when I was taking care of my stepmother as she was dying last year. Part of the vehicle for us to being together was carrying to the toilet, inserting the catheter, um, giving her pain medication, uh, holding her hand. Uh, these were all the vehicles for us being together, but we didn't get lost in the vehicles. We kept meeting behind the space, looking into another person's eyes. Are you there? Am I here? We're just two human beings being together through this drama. Let's not get lost in the drama. Let's stay together as fellow beings. That quality of allowing another human being to meet you that way starts to enrich you through relationship. And you end up, I end up, feeling graced and helped by everybody I supposedly help. I work with AIDS patients now. And those are very hard and horrendous situations at one level. At another level, it is another soul just like me who happens to be going through a different storyline than I am at the moment. And if I 
am caught in, oh, this poor person with AIDS, all I do is suck them into their suffering more deeply. And it turns out that if you really want to heal people and define healing as the surcease from suffering, you have to accept your role is more than being a physical healer. Because many of you know people that were physically healed that didn't stop suffering. And many of you, I'm sure, have met people who were not physically healed who were not suffering. Part of the work we do is with pain and the ways in which one approaches pain in such a way that one doesn't get lost in pain and one can awaken and get freer and more spacious through the way one has commerce with one's own pain. Because the minute one resists against the pain and pushes against it, the resistance itself creates the suffering. And so part of the same work is how you approach healing. If you go the deeper level and say healing is I am trying to be an instrument for relieving people from suffering. The relief from suffering may involve dying and it may involve living. You don't know that. And the problem of defining a, a medical role somehow as godly in I must take over God's role of keeping this person alive or deciding who lives and who dies puts you in a position that is a losing position. It's a losing strategy. There's no doubt about it. And it's a painful one, terribly painful one. So I guess all I could do today in this brief time we've had that is just to raise the issue for you of where you are standing inside yourself in regard to the work you do every day. Because it is your inner stance that determines whether the work you do liberates your patients, releases them into a more spacious awareness through the way you do it, and also what it does for you, whether it heals you. If your work of healing isn't healing you, something's wrong. If I understand it right, a relationship, a real relationship between two human beings, whether it's the bank clerk or your patient or your wife or your children, should heal you and you should be enriched by it, not depleted by it. And yet, I, how many of us at the end of the day, oh, I'm exhausted, I'm so depleted because I was giving so much. That's a stance in your mind. It's the giving model that's burning you out. It's not what you did all day. People say, no, it's what I did. But you know you can come home exhausted and wiped out and somebody you love calls you and suddenly, oh, hi, and the energy's back and you're wide awake again. And it was something to do with your mind. And it, my feeling is that we spend a lot of time filling the mind with content, but we very rarely examine the way in which the mind itself works. So I just encourage you, I must... I must just encourage you to explore the possibility that you use the adventure of service as a vehicle for opening up the exploration of who you are in relation to what you're doing. Because I think if you were less a nurse and less a doctor and more an awareness who was being a nurse and doctor, your payoff would be improved considerably and death would become an interesting part of nature rather than an error and a failure. And you could still do your work, in fact, perhaps even more impeccably. Thank you very much for allowing me to come here and speak to you. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.